morning. I'm Steve Albert. Thank you for coming. This is the third in a series of lectures about four women who shaped and funded some of Cincinnati's greatest 20th century art collections, which were all ultimately given to the public. Before I start the lecture, while everything in this lecture can be footnoted, I have not been shy about using literary, poetic, photographic, and other licenses in telling Mary's and her peers' stories. All references to dollars have been converted into 2023 dollars. It's what a piece of art could be purchased for or would be sold for today. How did I get interested in art history? Well, it started with this man um, and dates back to high school when I had Arnie Ellenies as an art appreciation teacher. I would ultimately go to the same university Arnie went to, the University of Wisconsin. Arnie's career took off because of an act of generosity. He donated, he donated a print to a local TV auction. The next Monday, the school was flooded with admirers calling my high school and asking about the availability of his prints. Arnie quickly learned that he could not be a high school art teacher, a producing artist, and run a gallery at the same time. He would soon become one of the most successful commercial printmakers of Midwestern landscapes over the next 50 years. But not before teaching me some of the great holdings in the Louvre, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Medici's palaces. Now, how did I get interested in Cincinnati's uh, great female art collectors? I started out with being curious of how art gets into a museum. I learned that you can kind of identify how something gets into a museum by looking at the placard. This is, the, this is usually placed near the piece of art. On the last line will often contain an decision, agreement, a set condition, acceptance number. Call it a registration number. The first four numbers usually refer to the year in which it was acquired. Above that line will commonly identify whether it was purchased, a bequest, or other. I invite you to look for Mary Hannah's and Mary Emery's and Mary Johnson's name the next time you visit the Cincinnati Art Museum. If you look carefully, you'll even find Anna Taft's name there. This is the quartet of great Cincinnati women collectors whose names can be found throughout Cincinnati's great museums. They are Anna Sinton Taft, Mary Hanna, Mary Johnson, and Mary Emery. Is Mary Emery we'll focus on today. A quick review of each of the women's backgrounds and accomplishments and largesse. Mary Johnson. In the first of this series, I spoke about Mary Johnson, or Miss Mary, as she was known in Glendale. She was an accidental heiress. In the sense, she was born middle class, but had the good fortune of having an uncle that was the grandson of the founder of Proctor and Gamble, William Cooper Proctor, who had no children. She would collect exclusively artists that were alive in her lifetime. Mondrian, Modigliani, Picasso, Chacal, Matisse, Braque, Van Gogh, George Rouault, her favorite, were all alive in her lifetime. Unlike the other three women, she did not rely heavily on the advice or opinions of others those others being art advisors, scholars, accomplished artists, museum directors, or dealers. She purchased by instinct and trusted her own eye. She would buy fresh. She would visit artist studios, attend gallery openings. She would become friends with artists. She would collect the art of the new, or as Robert Hughes, Time Magazine's art critic, would catalog it, the shock of the new. She enjoyed delving into modern pre-war art, not only as a collector, but a student and sponsor of conferences and symposiums on modern art here in Ohio. And because she collected from artists or their gallerists, 
she was able to acquire some of the world's most important modern art pieces for a pittance. This is a Piet Mondrian that she purchased for less than $10,000. It broke auction records selling for $49 million over 50 years after she acquired it. Now, this was an extreme outlier. Some of the works that the four purchased appreciated, and indeed some of them did not. I recently spoke about Mary Hanna. Mary was Henry Hanna's only surviving child. Henry was a regional Warren Buffett with vast and diverse commercial interests in banking, coal, iron, railroads, gas, electric, telephones, and real estate. He left her an estate of $150 million, give or take. After her father died, she lived in a 10,000 square foot mansion in Hyde Park that her father began building for her before he died in 1905. These are a couple pieces from her collection, a George Romney, a uh, English portrait artist, and a Dutch piece um, by uh, Von Rysdale, a landscape. Mary was publicity shy. In her later life, she preferred not to have her name in the papers. So much so that in the summer of 1946, when the president of CAM's Board of Trustees made the grand public announcement of her no strings attached princely gift to the Cincinnati Art Museum of 34 European paintings by masters such as Franz Hall, Rembrandt, Edgar Degas, Gainsborough, Renoir, J.M. W. Turner, Mary Cassatt. Where was Mary at this time? Well, she arranged to be safely out of town, out of state, vacationing in Maine. Anna Taft. Anna married Charles Phelps Taft. She was the only one that had a spouse with whom she collected. But it was Anna's late father, the Iron Baron, David Sinton, that funded their collecting. He left his entire fortune to her, his only surviving child, in 1900. The amount of this state was about $700 million. The Taft's collecting was on a broader scale than the others and included Jing Dynasty ceramics, Renaissance enamels, English uh, artists of the Barbizon school, Dutch masters, English portrait artists, and some American artists, such as this one by Frank Duvenek, which I can only imagine inspired Bob Castellini's great piece of graffiti art or street art downtown. Now to Mary Hopkins Emery. The way I'm gonna tell Mary's stories, it, story is as follows. First, who was she? Where did the Cincinnati transplant come from? Second, where did her wealth come from? Uh, spoiler alert, her husband, Thomas Emery whose career we will explore today. We will also explain why she's occasionally, but I believe un incorrectly, referred to as the loneliest millionaires. We will then pivot and explore a small portion of the French, Italian, and Spanish paintings that she would collect and collect only after her husband died. We will then investigate the lives of the artists she collected will explore who advised her on her purchases, which dealers she would work with, and who she was competing against during the extraordinary period between 1890 and 1925, during which the largest appropriation of English and European history to the United States ever occurred. Finally, we take note of just a few of her other accomplishments and later life passion. Mary's father was a dry goods merchant. Mary was born in Manhattan in 1844. Her first home was in a very fashionable, rapidly appreciating neighborhood near Washington Park. When she was seven, her family moved out to the suburbs, in this case, Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, this is the school she attended, the prestigious Packer Collegiate Institute of Brooklyn Heights, in Brooklyn Heights. It was an academically rigorous school where Mary would not only take, but excel in 
algebra, geometry, trigonometry, physics, and astronomy. There she would gain some notoriety as a math and astronomy whiz. This is the school, and I think that might be Mary back there if we look carefully, writing out a proof of the cosine of the sum of two arcs. She loved learning, and this is the photo that she treasured all her life. Picture of her with one of her high school mathematics teachers. In 1862, her father decides to move to Cincinnati. It's vibrant, it's cheap, he has family connections, and by golly, it is growing. The Roebling Bridge is yet to have been finished. He will go into, the dry, into a dry goods partnership with a relative on Fifth and Vine. Mary's father would purchase a home in one of Cincinnati's best neighborhoods at the time, Mount Auburn, which was much, much cheaper than Brooklyn, as Cincinnati remains much, much cheaper than Brooklyn today. Mary's a bit of an odd duck. She is more intellectual better trained, more accustomed, accustomed to the sophistication of New York's high society than her Cincinnati peer group. She took full advantage of Cincinnati's cultural opportunities, attending theater productions, musical performances, poetry readings, and lectures. Visiting museums, however, there really weren't any. She was demure and never wanted to call attention to herself, yet she had great confidence that a good education and a love for knowledge brings. She could walk into almost any room and know that she could hold her own in any conversation. And she needs this self-confidence because just one year after arriving in Cincinnati, her father dies. Where did Thomas J. Emery's, Mary's future husband's wealth come from? Well, he and his brother, John Josiah Emery, inherited a family lard oil and candle making business. Like many other businesses, the Emery's candle and oils business profited tremendously by the surge of demand created by the Civil War. They had the right candle formula, were located on the right river, were able to access the B&O Railroad, and perhaps most importantly, they were on the right side of the war. In 1866, Three years after the death of her father, Thomas and Mary would meet, fall in love, and marry. Their honeymoon? Well, of course, Europe. For how long? Well, uh, naturally, a, a full year, as was common amongst the upper classes in that era. During their time in London, they would explore the South Kensington Museum, which we know now as the Victoria and Albert Museum. Mary was fascinated with the museum's concept of art students having immediate and on-site access to a great museum's art collection while concurrently being open to the general public. Charles and Anna Taft would later also become queenly interested in the concept. The museum was then described as a schoolroom for everyone. The London public occasionally and affectionately referred to it as Albertopolis, after the king's beloved, after the country's beloved king. Here's a picture of it today. Not much difference, is it? Mary has her first son, Sheldon, a year later in 1867, and her second son, Albert, perhaps named after the English king himself, a year later. Thomas and his brother realized there is a heck of a lot easier way to make money and make more money than competing with Andy Jurgen, Billy Proctor, and Jimmy Gamble, and the 28 other candle makers in town. Their insight? There was a massive post-war early industrialization pattern taking place throughout America. The masses were migrating from rural America to industrialized urban centers. 5,000 per year to Cincinnati with extraordinarily high birth rates. They had few places to live. The brothers start their real estate business by building, renting, low-end housing 
to those of very modest means, but they quickly move upstream, adding rooms, amenities, building at better, more expensive locations, consistently employing high-end architects and accomplished builders, realizing the strategic value of rental real estate near Cincinnati's expanding streetcar lines and providing richer services. This allowed them to charge higher rents because there was a huge demand for upscale, high-quality apartments they built by the growing middle and upper classes. The Emmy brothers were extraordinary developers, builders, property managers, and innovators. This is just a micro sample of some of the apartments that survive to this very day. The Lombardi Flats. The Lombardi Flats uh, gained a immediate cachet as one of the toniest addresses in town. When the children of two prominent Cincinnati families got married in 1882, it was announced in the paper that their temporary residence was in Kepler's Hotel until their rooms at the Lombardi were ready for occupancy. It was a big deal. William Howard Taft rented a bachelor pad in the Lombardi. This is when he was renouncing a career in journalism to pursue a career in the law and later politics. Rent back then, approximately $1,500 a month. The San Marco was completed in 1894. It is an ambitious project that rises seven stories on Madison Road. It is across from the opposing and soaring spire of St. Francis de Sales Roman Catholic Church, which was built 15 years earlier. The San Marco was constructed as a luxury apartment, offering large flats for affluent families and it was located on the rapidly growing Cincinnati streetcar line, connecting apartment dwellers all the way to the downtown. At Emory Row, a group of historic row houses in the suburban part of Walnut Hills on Gilbert Street. It was originally composed of six individual small houses and, more, and a more substantial structure designed as a commercial building. So it's what today we'd call a mixed-use development. But this was an innovation at the time. The Alexandria is an historic apartment building located on Gilbert and Taft in Walnut, in Walnut Hills. It was constructed in 1904 and now provides affordable housing to seniors 120 years later. In 1881, family moves into their home in Walnut Hills, known as Edgecliff. Did I say home? I should have perhaps said grand estate. Servants occupied the top floors of the mansion, while carriage drivers and stable hands lived in the estate's massive carriage house. In 1935, after Mary's death, the home and estate was used to establish Our Lady of Cincinnati College for Women. The college changed its name to Edgecliff College in 1969 and became co-educational in 1970. The Emory's main house became Emory Hall, a student residence. You see it here. Um, in 1980, Xavier University acquired Edgecliff. Uh, it was demolished, however, in 18, 1987 in land being sold to developers which now occupy a multi-story uh, condominium project. Life's good. The Emory's two sons, Albert and Sheldon, would go to high school at St. Paul's, an elite Episcopal prep school in New Hampshire. Who else would have gone there? Cornelius Vanderbilt III, James Garfield Jr., William Randolph Hearst, William Howard Taft, What's a fair price to pay for a good boarding school education? Any guesses? Well, it's about $70,000 a year. But in February 1884, tragedy strikes. Mary's youngest son, Albert, is at school enjoying a crisp winter, competing in downhill sledding races or a two skate sled. Albert steers too close to one of his classmates who is pulling his sled up the hill and collides with his fellow student's sled with its front skate, 
hitting Albert Square in the temple. 9-11 is called, 9-1-1 is called. Well, not exactly. More accurately, the finest hospital in New England is telegraphed. Massachusetts General sends their best brain surgeon on the next train out of town. He removes the splinters from Albert's brain, but it's too late. Albert is buried days later in Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. Albert's older brother, Sheldon, gets into Harvard in 1884. Sheldon was good friends in college with his dorm mate, Charles Jacob Livingood. This is what Harvard dorms looked like at that time. These are sleeping rooms. You can see in kind of a general shared room. Uh, they were buddies. They both liked the outdoors. And on weekends, they would go hiking together. On school breaks, they'd go hunting and fishing together in Maine. Living Good was fairly brilliant. Graduating from Harvard cum laude in English literature, history, philosophy, he is fluent in French, having studied at the Sorbonne for a year after graduation. But Sheldon is not cut out for the academic rigor of the Ivy League, or perhaps he's just not interested in his course of study, which is law at the time, or perhaps he's still a little rattled from the recent death of his younger brother. In any event, he returns home to Cincinnati during the 86-87 academic year, lives at home, why not, plenty of room, and joins his father's and uncle's firm of making candles and oils as a chemist. But after a trip to Detroit to attend a wedding, he catches pneumonia and dies in his mother's arms in 1890. Charles Livingood, Sheldon's former dorm mate learns of Sheldon's death while he is working in Colorado. He immediately writes to Mrs. Emery of his sorrow and deepest sympathy upon learning of Sheldon's death. But he also expresses an interest in making himself useful to the family and its businesses, if perchance such an opportunity was available. He's invited to Cincinnati and starts at the bottom of the Emery Sons real estate empire supervising the wallpapering and painting of apartments. This is the apartment he first lives in. Look at the remarkable number of books in this apartment. He's good company, he's well-traveled, he's a former member of Harvard's Hasty Pudding Club, a brilliant letter writer, and by typewriter yet. He also has a keen interest in art history. This begins a lifelong relationship between Mary and Charles Jacob Livingood as aide, secretary, advisor, manager, surrogate son, and lifelong dear friend. In 1901, Thomas Emery confronts his mortality. He has a tumor removed from his jaw. He also acquires a modest estate, 18 acres near Newport, Rhode Island in Middleton. He presents the estate as a gift to his wife. It's titled Marie Mont. Marie for her name and Mont for the hill on which the home stood. He buys additional acres over time and turns landscape architect extraordinaire, John Charles Olmsted Luce, the older brother, the superior to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Thomas begins traveling to North Africa, French Algeria, for six months at a time, accompanied only by his valet. Mary staying home. Thomas believes that the climate will revive his health. In 1906, however, Thomas dies in Cairo, Egypt, which requires living good to obtain special dispensation from his Islamic law, which requires burial within 24 hours. The funeral is at the Emory's Edgecliff home. He is buried in Spring Grove Cemetery. One of the most prominent and curious out-of-town attendees is Booker T. Washington, who Thomas has befriended, encouraged, and funded in his later years. The value of his estate was rather shocking. 600 million to a billion dollars in today's dollars. Mary is now one of the richest women in America. Mary faces her new life with a nice pad, a nice vacation house, solid aid, 
surrogate son, entree into Cincinnati's society's highest echelons, and a monster income stream. Occasionally, she's referred to as the loneliest millionaires because of the death of her husband and sons. But that's not correct. While she would go through a period of mourning, she was not perpetually depressed. She doesn't have time. She has too much to accomplish. The myth came from a book uh, by uh, Stephen Birmingham, an, an uh, advertising agent. Uh, his uh, book titled Grand Dons, and it was published in 1984, 60 years after her death. Um, it's a good story about being the loneliest millionaires, but I, I don't think it's accurate. Anna and Charles Taft, Mary Emery, and later Mary Hammond shared the same vision of a great museum, a world-class international public art collection, and a great art academy for the good of all. For the good of those that could never afford a train ticket to New York, let alone a steamship to Europe, they would attempt to build in Cincinnati on the scale of the Victoria and Albert Museum. America's first generation of collectors, however, inherited no great works of art and therefore had to buy everything. These three ladies in particular, Mary Emery and Mary Hannah, would take up the challenge of acquiring enough world-class art to fill a museum. These three Cincinnati ladies would become a formidable buying force over the first 25 years of the 20th century. They would rival, challenge, and surpass some of the country's best art collectors during that time. What set them apart? from Eastern art collectors is that they were not competing against each other. They were exactly on the same page. 90% of what they acquire would fall into these schools of, of art. Where we're gonna to focus today is on the Barbizon School, uh, Spanish masters and Italian masterpieces. While she appreciated Anna and Charles Taft's Arts Council, she was going to build her own acquisition team. I've introduced one member of this three-member team. Now I will introduce the other two members of this team. Joseph Henry Guest was born in Cincinnati in 1859. He's about the age of Mary's sons and most importantly, the age of Charles Livingston a fellow Harvard alum. Guest was educated by private tutors and as a teen studied in Hanover, Germany before attending Harvard, where he and Living Good studied under Charles Eliot Norton. In 1875, Norton was appointed the first professor of art history at Harvard. Importantly, he centered his teaching upon the great established ages of art history, including the Dutch Golden Age, and early Italian and Spanish Renaissance art. Guest graduated from Harvard, became affiliated with the Cincinnati Art Museum in 1886. By, the time, by that time, he was assistant director of the museum. During his tenure as assistant director, he was put in charge of the Art Academy of Cincinnati. He spent this time developing a good relationship with the local artists, and he became close friends with Art Academy instructor, Frank Duvenek, who would spend Christmases with the Guest family. When Duvenek left the Art Academy following a dispute with the Academy's board chairman, it was Guest that was able to persuade him to return around 1900. Returning the favor, in 1902, the health of the first director of the museum began to fail. A new director was needed to be installed. At first, other candidates than guests were considered. But Duvenek, now director of faculty at the Art Museum, threatened to leave again and take all of his students with him if Guest wasn't made permanent director. Guest served as the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum from 1902 until 1932. This is a portrait of him. Anyone guess the artist? Correct, Frank Duvenek. Frank Duvenek 
was born in Covington, Kentucky to German immigrants in 1848. At age 21, Duvenek studied in Germany at the Munich Academy. He was an absolute prodigy. He loved studying, painting, and loved collaborating with others. While in Europe, beginning in 1869, he's able to get up close and study the works of Franz Hals, Rembrandt, Botticelli, Peter Paul Rubens. Now imagine, in 1869, I don't think any of those artists had canvases hanging in the entire U.S. at that time. Now this was well before J.P. Morgan and Henry Frillick would begin collecting. His artistic success was immediate. In 1871, now age 23, he wins a medal from the Bavarian Royal Academy. This is in the Cincinnati Art Museum's collection and was painted in 1871 in Germany. After returning to the United States in 1873 and settling in Cincinnati, Duvenek bursts upon the American scene with a spectacularly successful exhibition in Boston in 1875. He's now age 27. This painting is at the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. In a sense, Cincinnati is almost not big enough for this guy and is very lucky to have him. Art critics place him amongst the first generation of so-called American painters, painters. Included in the list, this list, George Innes, Winslow Homer, James McNeil Whistler, and John Singer Sargent. An often repeated quote from a casual remark that John Singer Sargent made at a London dinner party is as follows. After all said, Frank Duvenek is the greatest talent of the brush of our generation. Living Good, Guest, and Duvenek would form a team of advisors and counselors. They would assist and guide Mary's acquisitive eye for the next 20 years. Mary personally reviewed every painting that she would ultimately purchase, preferably either at Edgecliff in Cincinnati or Marimont in Rhode Island. The leading dealers at the time would need to bring their best works to her, not the other way around. Living Good had access to Mary and her purse. He would act as her corresponding secretary, agent, accountant, paymaster, arranger, transportation coordinator of the art that she would view for purchase. Guest would advise on big picture historical art trends and movements. He could provide the context and architecture for how specific paintings might contribute to the building and the integrating of her collection. Duvenek would serve as the esthete, the expert on the art of painting. Indeed, he's one of the most trained painting practitioners in America and a respected go-to eye for a final opinion. In a note to an art dealer, Livingood once wrote, Mr. Duvenek doesn't see anything proposed from your gallery worth Mary or the museum considering. Through Taft and now Mary Emery and later Mary Hannah, since he is enter, now entering a game that began in the 1890s, a game of cultural capture, whose origin was fueled by the growing mismatch between America's economic ascent and Europe's decline. And the Queen Cities team is bringing a substantial cash forward to this contest. To get our bearings, let's revisit the model I presented in my last lecture on uh, Mary, on Mary Hannah. Through the 18th century, this is an overly simplified or abridged view of the rules of the hierarchy of painting and collecting. It's substantially how many money flowed. At the top of the hierarchy were historic paintings and religious paintings. The historic paintings in some instances were funded by monarchs or publicly funded and represent well-known, enduring, grand historic or mythological events. All the paintings here are in uh, one or more collections in Cincinnati. Then came a religious paintings. Valuable to the wealthy church and its wealthy devotees. Then portraits. How, how better 
to show off one's affluence starting in the 1600s and continuing into the 1800s than having a grand portrait of yourself, your family, or your business associates in your home or your place of business. Then came genre paintings, the lively decorative paintings that often tell a story or teach a lesson that would provide a form of amusement from the walls of upper class, upper middle class homes. Then landscapes and seascapes, decorative idealizations of nature or of life on the seas or international commerce, followed by still lives, the most affordable containing subject matter that is easy for any artist to access and inexpensively arrange. Many first generation American collectors sought a benchmark, a stamp of approval, call it, for their purchases. Now one stamp of approval for many American artists at that time was the 1800s French Salon, Salon de Paris, or more commonly just the Salon. Between 1748 and 1890 was arguably the greatest annual or biannual art event in the Western world. Originally, the Salon exhibited paintings floor to ceiling in, in the Parisian royal residency, the Louvre. Salons provided a place for men and women to congregate and to conduct an intellectual discourse. It was really the launching pad of the art critic and art criticism as we know it. Today, it might be comparable to Art Basel, which is a jury in International Modern Art Fair, or be like the Whitney Biannual or the Venetian Biannual, all intense juried competitions where juries try to find both new faces and the best artworks of established artists. Related to the salon was the Prix de Roma. It was a French scholarship for art students Initially for painters and sculptors, it's kind of like a Fulbright bright grant for artists, but harder to get. In 1860, 16, the French Academy introduced a Prix de Roma in Paysage Historique, historical landscape painting. The prize was awarded every four years and enabled his, uh, its winner, the laureate, to live and work at the Villa Medici in Rome, all expenses paid in very elegant accommodations. But by creating this prize, the judges and institutions had just turned the traditional art hierarchy that we talk, talked about on its head. Landscape painting would now become all the rage in France. Because in the 1820s, it would be produced in great volumes by a great many artists and American collectors would follow, perhaps with too much zeal and too much cash. At the time, some young artists in pursuit of the prize started flocking to the Louvre to study 17th century Dutch Flemish landscapes. Others went to Italy to study the paintings of the great Italian paint painters, but another group headed ex directly for the French forest. One substantial forest that is a short train ride from Paris was the forest Fontainebleau. Its origins were un the unmapped preserve of kings and the royal hunting parties that stayed at the Ch Chateau Fontainebleau. There's the Chateau. One of the closest villages uh, in between the, uh, the uh, chateau and, the, and uh, civilization outside of the forest was the, bar was the village of Barbizon. And this is the actual local inn in which the artist would stay. This began an art movement that moved away from an idealized view of nature to a raw, more realistic view. Indeed, sometimes it's, this is referred to as realism or alternatively, the Barbizon School, when referring to French artists. Previous, previously, Romantic era painters idealized nature. And since they were idealizing it, they could paint from their studios, never really having to actually go outdoors and confront it. The realist or Barbizons 
challenge themselves to record the raw observations of nature and rural life without self-reflection or analysis. They challenge themselves to paint what's there, not what they wished was there. They believe beauty could be found in nature itself rather than its more abstract idealization. Theodore Rousseau was one of the earliest artists to venture directly into the outdoors to absorb, observe natural forms. Rousseau loved nature and expressing it through landscape paintings. He would ultimately pioneer and lead what would become known as the Barbizon School. This is a quote from Rousseau. Silence is golden. When, am I, when I am at my observation post at Belle Croix, I dare not move for silence enables me to penetrate the heart of discoveries. It's then that the forest families begin to stir. It was the silence that enabled me, standing as still as a tree trunk, to watch the stag cleaning himself. The man who lives in silence becomes the center of the world. Some art critics and historians attribute a grave melancholy element to Rousseau's paintings. In life, Rousseau suffered a series of misfortunes. His wife's mental health, his aged father, became dependent on him in later years, and he suffered from insomnia. His own health was often precarious as well. This Rousseau is titled Summer Sun Sunset. It was purchased in 1923 by Mary Emery for $402,000. Jean-Francois Millet was born of farming stock. He lived in Barbizon beginning in 1849 at age 35. His interest was in figures with, land, with a landscape backdrop. Now this sets him somewhat apart from the other um, Barbizon artists. Rousseau had the greatest regard for Millet and once during a period when Millet was questioning his own artistic direction and competency, Rousseau encouraged him by secretly purchasing a painting of Millet's. This is a, you know, a, about one example of the communal relationship or the esprit de corps that these painters had with each other. Millet celebrated the dignity of manual labor and the humanity, endurance, and piety of field workers in his paintings. This is the portrait that Mary Emery purchased in 1910. It's titled, Going to Work, Dawn of Day. Note how it is not an artificial idealized version of farm workers. We get a feeling of the early morning light that Millet knew well, being a farmer himself. The man is resolved, going to tend his fields, but his mind really seems elsewhere. In contrast, his wife is living in the moment. Her glass tells us, her glance, tells us she knows the artist is there. In a sense, Millet captures her as if she's glancing at a camera. The artist provides us with the feeling that we, the observer, are a curiosity to her. Mary purchased this painting in 1910 from an auction of a, a collector's paintings for $1.7 million. Remember, she didn't like to travel, so agents from Cincinnati's favorite dealer, Scott and Falls of New York and London, purchased it for her at the auction. All parking it, this is about 170 times what this painting likely sold for only 35 years later. This is getting a little crazy. The rapid appreciation of Barbizon art until recently, un, un, until recently unknown artists to new American collectors does not escape the eyes of America's keenest observer and satirist of the time. The Tom Wolfe, Woody Allen, P.J. O'Rourke of his day, Samuel Clemens, or as we know him, Mark Twain. Twain thinks this is absolutely folly, the amount of money being spent on these relatively new paintings. A dead man's painting, who until recently very few Mer Americans have heard of, rising in price a hundred times merely because he's dead? 
Well, by golly, in the land of capitalism, there just might be a comedy or tall tale here. Millay would become the inspiration of Mark Twain's play, Is He Dead? Uh, written in 1898. In the play, Millay is depicted as a struggling young artist who stays true to his artistic principles rather than selling, selling out. But he's deeply in debt and being hounded by a lender. What to do? Well, of course, conspire with your friends and fake your own death. And afterwards, dress as a woman to keep your secret safe. After he, quote, dies in the play, his friends promote his genius to increase the value of his paintings. The play it, it combines elements of farce, mistaken identities, romantic deceptions, and provides Twain a platform to raise questions about fame, the value of art, greed, art collecting, herd behavior, and conflicts of interest. To give you a feel for how frothy the art market is getting, in 1889, the French Ministry of Culture makes an effort to retain one of Millet's great masterpieces, the Angelus. They can't. In 1857, this painting of Millet's sells for $30,000. 32 years later, in 1889, an American arts organization acquires it for $3.3 million, 100 times more than when Millet was alive. Generously, they sell it back to a French collector the following year for about $4.8 million, a mere 45% appreciation in one year, or $1.5 million in profit in a year. This is now in the uh, Musée d'Orsay in, in Paris. Now these are two Salvador Dali paintings paying homage to Millet's Angelus. This top one sold at auction for $10 million at, at Sotheby's, which is also kind of crazy. This Barbizon painting came from the same auction that Mary had made her purchase of her Millet from. The artist is Constant Troyon. It's titled Return to the Farm. It then becomes the second highest price paid for a piece of European art ever sold in the US at auction for $2.1 million. Now, Mary had added one of her, uh, one added another Constant Troyon canvas titled Landscape with Goats to her collection a few years earlier in 1907 for a quarter of that price or $450,000. Again, the pricing of the Barbizon School is getting kooky. It is that era's modern art, but with a stamp of approval from the salon. Why and how was this pricing getting so out of whack? The underbidder, the penultimate bidder, the losing bidder for return to the farm at auction was Senator W. A. Clark, a Montana copper magnate. This is the type of collector who the women from Cincinnati were competing against. This is Senator Clark's chateau on Fifth Avenue in New York, effectively right across from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is at the absolute zenith of the Golden Age. This mansion contains 121 rooms, 25 guest rooms, each with their own baths, 35 servants' rooms, a swimming pool, a concealed garage, a private rail line to bring coal for heat, and I, yes, for art galleries. Many informed people believed that there was more art in Clark's house than in the entire Metropolitan Museum of Art across the street. This would cost the equivalent of $200 million to build today. Yet it's torn down 30 years later after it's built. In addition, the ladies from Cincinnati are also competing with more prominent names, such as Henry Frick, J.P. Morgan, Benjamin Altman, Isabella Stewart Gardner, and Henry Huntington, 
amongst others. Now, a sizable portion of of the Barbizon artists that Cincinnati, that the Cincinnati women would purchase, were from Scott and Fowles in New York. Um, also, with, as I mentioned, with the offices in London. Charles Fowles was Cincinnati's dealer of choice. The Tafts used him. Mary Emery used his firm. And Mary Hannah would eventually use his firm. But Scott and Fowles was not the absolute preeminent supplier of the finest works to the finest collectors. The undisputed preeminent gallerist of the time was Joseph Devine. And who said so? None other than Joseph Devine himself. Joseph Devine was an Englishman who built an illustrious career as an art pit purveyor, or by making one simple observation, Europe had built great generations of America's elite had unimaginable piles of cash. Declining European economies and World War I cemented an art for cash pipeline between Europe and the United States that endured for more than 40 years. Cincinnati's collectors were able to take advantage of a great tsunami of cultural artifacts and national treasures coming across the sea. And they were fairly early to the game. Duveen was born into the gallery business. Working on the floor of his father's gallery one day, Duveen observed a couple of well-dressed potential serious buyers who went upstairs to his father's office, which, from which he could overlook the gallery and reported that there were some fish on the line. His father looked, however, and did not recognize the couple and asked his son to find out who they were. Now the ingenious young Duveen immediately went out to the coachman attending their carriage and offered their five shillings in exchange for their names of their players. It was a lord and lady, a married couple of consequence. His father then was able to go down, greet them by name, and importantly, close the sale. Now, Duveen later sort of applied this technique and developed a network of agents throughout England and Europe that informed him when the great houses of England and Europe might be experiencing some declines in their fortunes and might possibly be willing to part with some of the art crowding their walls. This network might include tradesmen, valet servants, butlers, and such like, servicing some of England's grand estates. Duveen was an American tastemaker. Um, he very early dismissed the Barbizon school um, as being overdone, overbought, much too plentiful, and less valuable to collect in the long term than much rarer Dutch, Italian, and Spanish um, masters or great English portrait artists, of which he probably had a uh, sizable inventory. Duveen uh, believed that he had a twofold educational mission. One, to educate Americans as to what great art really was, and secondly, convince these Americans that they could only acquire the greatest art through Duveen. He would tell collectors that mere money was easy to acquire, but the opportunities that Duveen presented to his clients would only come along once in a lifetime. And with Duveen, it was always now or never. I've got another buyer interested. Duveen was the greatest salesman of art in the first 70 years of the 20th century. Duveen would sell Mary several paintings, uh, two of which we'll talk about today. This is a good example of the unique treasures Duveen would offer collectors. Now, this is a very unusual painting. It's by Andre Montagna. Montagna was born in Italy. Montagna was a court artist. He served the court of the Marquis de Gonzaga from 1860 until his death in 1506. Montagna was knighted in 1484, just an extraordinarily rare artist for any, a uh, rare honor for any artist in that day. Gondegla's 
collection was so distinguished that a number of his paintings were purchased 125 years later after his death by Charles I of England in 1627. Now, this painting is unusual for several reasons. First, it's on canvas in 1495. That's rare. Secondly, the paint is not oil or tempera as, as common for painting it, or, or oil. Or, uh, is not on tempera uh, used to paint on panel or oil used most commonly to paint on canvas. Instead, the paint is done in distemper, meaning the underlying pigments are bound with animal glue. The third unusual feature is that Montagna used only a small number of pigments, but the principal pigment in this painting is actually finely ground particles of pure gold. It was purchased by Mary from Duveen for $3 million in 1922. Duveen would also sell Mary a Velasquez. Rodrigo de Silva Velasquez was a Spanish painter, uh, baptized in 1599. In December 1622, the King of Spain's favorite court painter died. Velazquez received a command to come to the court from a Count Duke, a powerful minister of King Philip IV of Spain. He was offered 50 ducats to defray his travel expenses, and he was accompanied by his father-in-law. Now, 50 ducats were worth about $20,000, so they could, they could afford to travel first class. Now, the Duke allowed lodged the painter in his home and sat for a portrait, which when completed, was conveyed to the royal palace. It was well received. A portrait of the king was then commissioned, and in August 1623, Philip sat, Philip IV sat for Velasquez. The outcome, a portrait of the king, pleased the king, and the duke commanded Velasquez to move to Madrid, promising that no other painter would ever paint the king uh, during his lifetime. In the following year, 1624, he received 300 ducats, about $120,000 from the king, to pay the cost of moving his family to Madrid, which became his home for the remainder of his life. Now, these are super rare. There only exist about 121, 120 canvases of Velazquez in the world. This is the last painting that Mary would purchase and add to her collection in, in November 1925. The purchase price, $4.4 million. The last quest paintings also influenced 20th century artists such as Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali, and Francis Bacon, all paid tribute to Velasquez by reinterpreting some of his most iconic images. This is one of Velasquez's masterpieces, a portrait of Pope Innocent X. This is Bacon's interpretation. This last one sold at Sotheby's at auction last year, 2022, for $46 million. Sir Hugh Lane was another dealer that helped broaden the Cincinnati Art Museum's collection beyond the Barbizon School. At age 18, he begins working as an assistant to Martin Colma at his uh, prestigious Marlborough Gallery in London. Lane develops a phenomenal eye and a knack for dealing art, buying and selling art, originally exclusively only to Englishmen, but later to much wealthier Americans. He opens his own Paul Mall Gallery in London several years later. It's located in the Royal Opera Arcade. Now, this is the inside of that arcade where this gallery would have been. It's in 1923, Mary, Mary's Mary Emery's Cincinnati sort of friend, come intermediate art dealer, Miss Mary Morgan Newport, went to London to visit Sir Lane's gallery. 
after receiving information that he had about four masterpieces in his possession. Miss Newport sees two Titians in Sir Hugh's London Gallery. The one that catches her eye is of Philip II of Spain. The painting had remained in Titian's studio during his lifetime as a modello or a master from which other art which other court paintings were made. Miss Newport was so impressed by it that she hurried back to the U.S. and told Mary it was available. Mary immediately directs her team to enter into negotiations. The purchase made headlines in New York, London, and later Cincinnati. Now, the reported purchase price was for $12 million. Mary got it cheaper. The London Press berated its own National Gallery for not acquiring the, the painting for its aesthetic and historical importance. Now, art is an illiquid asset that normally comes with huge markups. Sir Hugh Lane, however, was not well capitalized. And if you're undercapitalized as an art dealer, it becomes something of a roller coaster of an existence. The money comes in, but the money also goes out. Now, Sir Lane purchased two of Titian's paintings in 1913 for $19 million each. In 1913, he was in precarious financial position. Mary would be able to buy it for only $9.4 million. Now, what's very interesting is that a year later, Henry Frick would purchase perhaps the other petition or at least another petition from Sir Lane, boy with a red hat, for $15 million in 1950. This puts Sir Yu back in business. A slightly earlier time, there was another type of art that was just beginning to be collected by a limited number of Americans, much of it by a single woman in Chicago, who was beautiful, dashing, quick, smart, and more than that, sure of herself. In the 19th century, Bertha Matilda Palmer made a bold move to become a champion and major collector of impressionistic art. While Palmer, Palmer was also a collector of Barbizon painters, her passion was impressionism. Over her lifetime, Palmer purchased around 90 works of Monet, including nine of his haystack paintings. One of them, this last one, recently sold at Sotheby's for $110 million. But this was very daring. Palmer also commissioned a major mural from an impressionist, uh, American impressionist, Mary Cassatt. The mural decorated the women's pavilion in the Columbian ex exhibition. It featured women and nude babies. The mass of 58 foot triptych was a critical flop and disappeared just after the exhibition closed. But the mural was a major step forward for the Chicago art scene. For the first time, the new impressions were on public view in the city. This is a view of inside the mansion of the Grand Dame of impression of it. Monster collector. We're now going to move from Mary's collecting and talk about her later life. But before I do so, a question has to be asked. How did these women and the Emery's wise acquisition team largely miss the Impressionist movement. Well, here's one a hypothesis. A guest in Living Gold studied at Harvard under Charles Eliot Norton, Harvard's first professor of arts, who taught them to admire the classics and did not really challenge them to examine the new. In Dubinick's travels to Germany, the Impressionist art movement had not really arrived yet. And the Impressionists never made it into the French Salon, that stamp of approval. 
Finally, two of her dealers came rather late to Impressionism themselves. Sir Hugh Lane only banned collecting Impressionists in 1904. This is exactly the same time that the Cincinnati women's dealer of choice, Scott and Falls, purchased their first man, Monet. And Charles has trouble inducing Impressionism to others. He considers opening a modern art gallery in Dublin, but Dublin is not ready for this type of new painting. The Irish don't approve of Renoir's buxom girls with manly arms. So Lane can't sell these in Ireland. Nine years later, in 1913, Lane offers 39 paintings to the National Gallery in London. It's for the purpose of founding a collection of modern European art. But the museum says, hey, we're only interested in 15 of these 39 paintings. Now, remember the deal that necessitated Sir Lane's trip to New York in early 1915, the remarkable sale of a Titian to Henry Frick for $15 million. Well, his return trip, trip was on was on the Lusitania, which was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat. Now we know this Renoir and this Monet were in his collection when he died, and the women's favorite Cincinnati art collector, who had also just begun purchasing Impressionist art, was Charles Fowles. He was also on the boat. If they had survived, would they have eventually introduced Emory into Impressionism? We'll never know. But we'll note that Mary Hannah would later dip her toe into the movement and contribute to Renoir, Degas, and Mary Cassatt, the Cincinnati Art Museum. Mary's life after her husband died reveals two other passions. In 1909, she plans to one-up her mere apartment builder and manager husband and his brother, Mary signs living with the task of finding a site for a massive master plan community. Marimont, or Marymont as we know it today. Living good goes to Europe to study planned communities in England, Germany, France, Italy, Norway. But he goes even further, expect, inspecting housing developments in Turkey and South Africa. He goes to all the major city planning conferences throughout the world. He's networking with the best municipal planners in the universe. He's also hunting for land that is removed from the dust and smoke from Cincinnati's cold burning furnaces. He's looking in Pleasant Ridge, Kennedy Heights, Price Hill, Sharonville, but Mary thinks they are too distant and isolated from Cincinnati. Living good, and Mary finally select an area near Madisonville, Linwood, and Fairfax to acquire and begin acquiring land. But he has to do so surreptitiously. He wants to avoid publicity, defend off speculators, and unreasonable potential holdouts. So he creates this huge smokescreen, working with a Chicago realtor, William Ellis, who was employed to act as the purchaser, and a local agent, who was then employed by the Chicago purchaser, but has no idea what the land is being purchased for. A bank in Philadelphia is then used to issue uh, checks for the purpose of further disguising the purchase of the property. Living Good visits and inspects each parcel before it's purchased. Occasionally, his early morning and late afternoon prowlings would be interrupted by an irate farmer with a shotgun. In all, 31 parcels were purchased. Rumors swirl. Some think the Pennsylvania Railroad is making the purchase for an immense repair shop. Because, of course, the checks are coming from Philadelphia. Other, more romantic gossips, gossips thought it might be the location for a, for a movie studio. They would imply, employ the best city, city planners and landscape architects in America, including Frederick Law Homestead Jr., whose firm almost single-handedly was responsible for developing the profession of landscape architecture in the United States and trained generations of professionals, many of whom created their own firms, including John Nolan, who would be recruited to work on the project. The project is announced in 1922 and construction begins in 1923. 759 planned uh, homes are planned, 
over 253 acres, and a population of 5,000 was envisioned. Now, my best back of the envelope guess is that Mary would need access to about $200 million of capital to, full, to pull this off, which she has access to. Thomas Emery was most generous to those who demonstrated inclination to helping themselves. He believed in temperate and industrious frugal living. After Mary's, after his death, Mary made large donations in his name to the Ohio Mechanics Institute to construct a new building, which was dedicated to teaching men and women how to earn a living by learning a trade or profession. The donation went towards constructing an entirely new building, which included a foundry, a metallurgical and physics laboratory, a 2,200 seat auditorium or theater, mechanical drawing rooms uh, for training, um, telephone stations for training telephone operators, a woodworking and automobile shop, dressmaking, embroidery, and domestic science rooms. And on every floor, state of the art at that time, sanitized and cooled water. Her donations totaled $47 million in her husband's name. In 1969, the Ohio Mechanical Institute was merged into the University of Cincinnati's College of Engineering and Applied Scientists. Mary passed away in 1927. The executor of her will, of course, was Charles Livingood. This is a picture of Mary in the middle of the Living Good family. Charles is in the back. She left him with explicit instructions for arranging her funeral at Christ Church on 4th Street. Right, let me give you an example. If Clinton Chalmers, a musician whose career she had supported, is in the U.S., please ask him to arrange an aria in box suite D major. For 47 paintings, Roughly a $90 million collection would be left to the Cincinnati Art Museum. She would leave the bulk of her state, approximately $750 million, to the Thomas J. Emory Memorial. The general purpose of the memorial was to better and improve the lives of Cincinnati citizens by, improve, by improving their initial living conditions and education. She wanted everyone to have an equal chance of succeeding. We know the Thomas J. Emory Memorial today as the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. The size of its assets, do any of you know? I, I, I certainly didn't. About a billion dollars. In her will, she would provide for her loyal aide, surrogate son, and lifelong friend, uh, Living Good, and would leave him. $12 million. And he would serve as president of the Cincinnati Art Museum, the Thomas J. Emory Memorial, loyally watching over Mary's, or as she was referred to by William Proctor, Lady Bountiful's generosity until his death in 1955. Thank you.